Well, spring is coming. Gardeners are just waiting to dig in and we are right there with you. Our spring great gardening special is meant to inspire and to help gardeners at every stage get ready for the growing season ahead. Tonight, we're talking about new plants, the perfect garden layout for beginners, and we have a couple of garden tours to whet your appetite. And of course, we'll also answer your early season questions. Great gardening is straight ahead. We're like producing a serious amount of food. We hope to be able to provide food for the community. I love sharing the garden with others. You can do a lot of fun things with broccoli. All of our students here are involved in gardening. It has a sign on the door that says my happy place and it really is. Well, welcome to the Great Gardening Spring Special. We are thrilled to be talking about and thinking about planning and growing this year and equally happy to have two great gardeners with us. I'm Karen Sunderman in the studio with Bob Olin, horticulturalist, educator, all around awesome encyclopedia. <laughs> And Deb Erickson, thank you so much. Decades of gardening knowledge. Welcome, you guys. It is really a pleasure. And to all of our viewers, they must know that Karen was the inspiration for this show about 17 years ago. I was a and, kid then. And this is just such Baby. a pleasure for us. It's kind of like deja vu all over again, right? In a better way, though. In a better way. And gardening yes. has keeps going and changing and adding new people to it. And Deb, I'm just so happy that you're a part of this, too. I, I feel very fortunate to be here. It is a great program and great information and knowledge to share with everyone. The best gardeners I know are always learning. You know, I mean, none of them I'd say, nope, there's nothing else to learn, you know. It's the number one hobby in the United States, continues to grow. And the wonderful thing about local television like this and what you're producing is we can bring some very localized knowledge. Because all gardening really is local. Yeah, and definitely here. <laughs> definitely here. <laughs> in the next half hour, we'll talk about we'll be answering your questions that you've sent in by email. And we are still limited in the studio with COVID restrictions, but you can still get your questions to our experts by emailing us at ask at wdse.org. We'll get to as many of them as possible and save the rest for a future show. Now, we've got a lot of ground to cover from top performing plants to planning your garden and more. But first, let's talk about where we are now. We're coming out of a winter. Uh, perennials have been tucked in and cozy under all that snow. What's what are the conditions? Well, we were fortunate. We had that fall snow, that blanket uh, that insulated things quite well. We had reasonable moisture coming into the fall, but we haven't had too much snowfall. So the great thing about gardeners, if we do get some snow and we do come back to averages, as we've talked about, uh, it's actually going to be good because we really want abundant snow for a, a nice gentle runoff to fill the soil with moisture because all the projections are for a warm and rather dry year when we get past the planting sign time. Mm. And, and cold, I, cold. And cold, yeah, it was cold. But also we didn't have, I don't think we have near the vole pressure or the mole, you know, not the pest pressure that we did last year. No, we don't. I have I not seen agree. that. And I think that's a huge thing to our perennials and preserving them and not eating out the crowns. I think it should be a good year for that. Should be and less pressure from snowshoe hair because the, uh, the snow levels really are considerably less than they were this past year. And not a lot of winter drying winds either, so we're not seeing a lot of winter desiccation. So actually, we're coming through the winter pretty well at this point. So far. Exactly. So yeah, far. Wait, that makes me want to knock <laughs> on oh, it isn't somewhere. over yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Bob, do you have all your seeds purchased for the year? I have a lot of seed purchased. I, like everybody else, might be waiting for some to come, but I don't want people to get too discouraged because uh, there is seed out there, it is available. You might have to shop a little bit harder this year than you have in the past, but people will get seed for sure. And mm -hmm. Deb, you're already in the greenhouse. Right, right. We have all of our seed. And uh, yeah, but I wonder about the supply lines, if they're going to be tight this year, because so many people are into it and so many people are gardening. And it, it's a good, again, to plan and be prepared and get what you need to get going. Absolutely. That's great advice. And you have been um, playing with some new plants, some new petunias yes. in your greenhouse. Yes. So tell me, tell me what's hot out there in the world of petunias. Um, more of bicolor, a lot of uh, pattern to petunias, which makes it, again, easier for gardeners growing. Um, you can put one thing into a 
pot and make a nice looking combination even though it's only one thing because they're um, coming out with more spots with more colors more stripes um, really good vigor and um, just new stuff let's take a look at no what, what is this one called bees knees, bees knees. The bees that's a great knees name <laughs> it's a new yellow that starts um, pale but gets actually darker there's a lot of really good buzz about it in the trade um, pun intended yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Good one, Deb. <laughs> yeah, good one, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, bees knees. And then another of the headliner, um, uh, Sky. Um, is that the Glacier one? Um, there's a few new skies with new spots um, that really change with the weather, too. And so you get even a change in pattern with different temps. And then that gold, uh, that um, double petunia is fantastic has really nice habit the black and gold is really um sophisticated and almost formal it's a really pretty petunia interesting mm -hmm. yeah and oh and then the yeah the um color blaze or color rush and those are really vigorous really nice um you really only need one in a container, but everyone's going to put three. And then <laughs> cut them back on July 5th. Mm -hmm. oh, we yeah. promised to cut okay, them back. Okay, good, good, good. I hope 5th. so. <laughs> but when, when it has stripes and, and splashes and mm -hmm, stuff, mm -hmm. uh, pairing it with something else is always my question. You know, right. Do you or don't you? What do you it's, match it's it with? It's difficult. I mean, unless you just go with the foliage. Because we have done that, and we have tried to combine things. But if they're not either spot on or else really contrasting, I would go to contrast more or just add an, a foliage to it because it is hard to make sure that color stays you know stable with the with the spots and stripes so maybe just contrast or something with foliage oh, what fun you know it's just something really fun to look forward to <laughs> I know Bob <laughs> I know Bob you're excited about your planters <laughs> well at Great Gardening we are all about setting you up for success and the team at the University of Minnesota's North Central Research and Outreach Center in Grand Rapids field tested a bunch of new annuals this year or last year let's take a look at the list of top 10 and you know what the very top one is a lantana and those mm. are so cool they're beautiful they're great and deer don't like them because they have a citrus fragrance to the plant so deer resistant Put it on the top of your list. Well, always. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Check mark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th what is this one? Bubble gum. Bubble gum's been out for years, but it's a great plant and it's very difficult to beat. Yeah, because it really fills out, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a fantastic zinnia, zowie. Yellow flame. <laughs> yep. And th they're easier to grow. They're getting really good at breeding with less disease for yeah. the zinnias. So the newer ones are much better than some yeah. of the older ones. And it, can be direct seeded as well as coming in from the transplant. So Absolutely. really nice and nice for young kids and, and uh, families as or well. Or even starting now. Sure. So then they can take cuttings from it and you could start your zinnias really early. Very easy to, mm -hmm. to work wow. with. And good success. Really mm -hmm. good success. Because you want them bushy, not spindly. And That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So take a cutting. Ah, okay, there's a couple other petunias that they tried out. Mm -hmm. This one is the Easy Wave Rose Fusion. Brand new. Yep. Brand new. Yeah, brand new, so I don't know. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it did well in Grand Rapids. Trial, right. Yeah. And then there's a, uh, three begonias. This one is the Double Delight Blush Rose. Does that mean like the little flowers look mm -hmm. like almost impatience or a little? Well, they're really double. Uh, they always have a male and a female, so there's always a double and a single, but that's a really nice big flower to it. And, and begonias taste like lemons if you, taste, mm. if you eat the flowers. Mm. Huh. Interesting. The closer it is to yellow, the more lemon, then the farther away, more red, more muddy. Does it count for the three vegetables and two fruit we're supposed to eat a day? <laughs> <laughs> we hope. <laughs> uh, there, there's a couple more begonias, a double uh, red, a red on chocolate and a double up red. And then there's three petunias on their list. One is the, the silver, which I love that little purple eye. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is so cute. And the Supertunia Mini Vista Indigo. Smaller flower, really good vigor. And same with the, um, the Rose Star or is Pink Star. Um, both of those are the Vista Minis. Really great plants. A little bit nicer than Calibrachoa, easier to manage. Yeah, e e um, Calibrachoa are like, I love them, but I they're... Know. If they do well, they do incredibly well. But if they don't, they can completely fail. Yeah, we're, we're not about that. No, we're mm -hmm. about success. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that it really is exciting to see what plants are tested in northern Minnesota, in our soils, and they're looking for uniformity and uniqueness and how floriferous 
Mm-hmm. And insect and disease resistance they are. And you know, Deb, you've seen these annuals and you're probably growing some of them. Uh, but what can we be doing now as home gardeners? What, what should be seeding, no right, seeding? Right, we could be seeding. We can definitely be seeding some herbs because again, if you get it to germinate, and then you can take a cutting later and you could have a dual purpose. I mean, because then you can actually have more cuttings and more cuttings and then you could try to carry them over some of the, you know, the um, rosemary, lavender, some of those things that are pretty, they can be easy to take cuttings from. Um, but yeah, And the zinnias, you can take those. But cuttings are really like, we have this, Trita scantia, and, um, a lot of people have this in their home and it's really easy to start these too and you can just take a cutting of course we just usually pinch but and you just take the cutting and you stick it in rooting hormone and then you just stick it in your we do flats and like this flat is probably two weeks old and so again 70 degrees just lightly moist not too heavy and don't get heavy soil when I was trying different soils, if they're heavy, do not get them. Do not, they want a nice light, almost a succulent feel to them. A really nice light soil, no moisture control, because they'll just rot. And so then you just stick them, and then in a month, they'll look like this. Of course, this is one of the easiest things to propagate. So for a beginner to start, this is where you should try, because you will get a lot of success. Do you do the heating pad underneath there to get a more warmth or do you do any of those tricks? People can. We have under bench heat. We have, you know, 100 foot benches with just heat running underneath them. It makes a huge difference. But 70 degrees for seed germination Mm. and for cuttings is, yeah, you have to. Because if you don't, the whole seed won't germinate. Parts of it can germinate at 60, you know, if, if, if you lose that temperature. But you really need to keep it there and keep it consistently. Like these little takeout containers are nice because they a dual purpose again. You lay your seeds, you do a light cover, not much, do a really light, and then water it nicely. And then again, go by weight. Once you have it watered, then don't water it again if it, until it's getting a little bit light, especially if you have a cover, because that'll retain most of the moisture and you don't want to get them too wet. And then uh, you'll have consistent temperature and consistent moisture. Exactly. And Deb, maybe you want to touch a little bit on the differences in media, because people, if they're seeding, they don't want to just grab a soil mix that has fertility in it. Right. Because that can be real dangerous. So you really want a mix that's uh, a seed mix and it's identified as that, or just spin the bag around, look for the ingredients, and make sure that there isn't any fertilizer of any type included. Right. For, and a lot of the seeding. bags show that they have fertility. I'm surpri- surprised. Even some of the starting, they had moisture control. And really look for moi- Don't get moisture control for seed starting or for cuttings. Because if they get wet, and these things don't use a lot of moisture, the seeds don't use a lot and so they can get wet really easily. Yeah, you have to be a little bit careful because fertility sells, but in this case you don't want it, and moisture control sells, and all this innovation sells, and it's, it's not what you really want for starting establishing either seed or cuttings. Yeah, but it still looks really exciting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's really exciting. <laughs> well, I know what I'll be doing this weekend. Now, I, we have some good tips coming up about vegetables and planting a new garden, and we'll answer your questions right after a visit to Marengo, Wisconsin. Shirley and Tim Long have an extensive country garden filled with color and we are all looking for that green right now so let's take a look it's a beautiful tone when you're out too when you're out here weeding and it's a little breezy day you can listen to the wind chimes hi my name is Shirley Long we are in Marengo Wisconsin and I'd like to welcome you to our gardens I love my lilies, I do. They are, they don't last very long, but they are so fragrant and they give so much color and height to the gardens. I don't spend a lot of money on annuals because um, I have so much color from the perennials that I don't really need to have a lot of pots around. A couple of years ago, I took it all apart. I took everything out of here. And I thought, well, it's a good shady area. I thought I'd make it a hosta garden. So I probably think there's probably 30 some different varieties. This is 
Sophie's little, our granddaughter who is six. This is her little garden. I gave that to her and she has designed it and puts everything where she wants it. I love the fairy garden. It's just uh, magical and mystical. There is a lot to take in for winter. <laughs> and the sauna, sorry to say, becomes a storage shed. <laughs> so we can't use the sauna come <laughs> October because all my little fairy garden stuff has to go in the sauna. <laughs> There's nothing better than going out in the garden and picking fresh blueberries for your cereal in the morning and picking green beans for your supper at night. So we're pretty much organic here. All the gardens are always a work in progress. <laughs> you get them some way and then you change them over. And uh, so it's, that's what's fun about gardening. If you don't like something, you can always change it. I like that attitude. You can always change it. And that, you know, <laughs> good gardeners are, are they kind of know. You can always change it. They should, yeah. All right, here, here's some question and answers. And thank you for those who have sent in their questions, even during this show. Uh, what is the best variety of petunia uh, that doesn't need to be deadheaded? Well, okay, mm -hmm. bubblegum that they showed. Uh, we do have one customer that they get enormous. In my opinion, they look a little leggy, technically. Supertunias are not supposed to need deadheading, but the larger the flower, the more you have to deadhead. So go for a smaller one, there's minimal deadheading, but it really, if it's a big um, petunia, you will have to deadhead it. Okay, all right, well, bubblegum's pretty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Bob, I have a bell pepper, planted a bell peppers for the last two summers, red and yellow. They stay green and don't change colors. How about that? <laughs> How come? <laughs> uh, that's just, of course, because uh, the color is the mature form and we don't have a lot of heat in northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin. It just so happens I've had that question answered so many times. I'm designing several research plots and different systems to look for varieties. Uh, you have to be very careful with variety suggestions. I would uh, try a couple. You might try Carmen. You might try lipstick. You might try... Uh, uh, King of the North, uh, these are varieties that give you a thick wall. So what I'm going to be looking for is peppers that we can mature, go from green to red, purple, orange, and yellow within our growing season, and a thick wall because people really like to roast peppers. So uh, ask me next year the way that research <laughs> works out. Well, maybe, maybe we'll maybe we'll ask this this uh, this person how they do with that. Yes, That's Deanne. Yes. So, so Deanne, hopefully you have good luck. Um, next question is about a natural, non-toxic pest control for plants. And I know that you are right, doing things. Right, we do a lot of biological control, a lot of um, different predatory insects. And our number one pest pressure for us is aphids. And so we do a couple different ones, lacewing larvae and uh, Alphadite colomanes. Um, that will take them out, but commercially they're available. But also if you come to the greenhouse and you find a little mummy or you find a little beneficial, then you buy it on that plant and then you have them because then they'll you know, uh, reproduce and go on. But there are a lot, they're developing more and more because the trend is going that way and it's a great thing to see. Yeah. We're looking for that in the greenhouse is one thing. We perhaps want to caution people. Sometimes they'll spend a lot of money on predatory wasps and put them outside in their garden, mm -hmm. and then they're gone. The same thing with the ladybugs, ladybugs. As, a, as an example. So in terms of biological controls in the vegetable garden, uh, the bacillus, yes. that particular group is tremendous. I'll use a name brand here, uh, Dipel, which people are familiar with. But bacillus thuringiensis is a, is a naturally occurring bacteria. It only affects the gut of uh, the larval form of the moths that causes problems. And you do want to look for, we have three that are being sold in the area. Uh, you want to look in most cases for bacillus kerstaki. Israeliensis is another one that's used for uh, mosquito control. And bacillus thuringiensis uh, San Diego is used for Colorado uh, beetle control in the very small larval form. So I think the BTs broadly defined are very effective out in the in the garden for control of a lot of these insect pests and they're they're non-toxic certainly. And they're developing more and more. Yeah. More are coming there and yeah. these were naturally occurring in the soil many of them and mm -hmm. they're really selecting they're looking for these they're living materials so they need to be applied 
once you're not going to get a lot of residuals, so you're going to have to come back mm -hmm. and apply probably on a weekly basis okay. so you're sure you've got active bacteria that are working there. They're telling me to move on, but is this a spray or something that goes in the soil? Always buy the wettable powders, stay away from the talc mm -hmm. powders. You're not going to get the effectiveness. So buy a wettable powder that you're going to add in a slurry to a pump sprayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the best way to apply upper and lower leaf surfaces, full contact across the plant, and they can be very effective and they're safe. Okay, cool. Thank you. Really, thank you for the information. This spring gardening special is a taste of what's ahead on great gardening. There are a lot of features in the works and we made a list so we didn't forget. We're working on recruiting a new host, recruiting some field contributors. Uh, we're building an online library with tips and frequently asked questions. So when you come up with that thing, how do you deal with Creeping Charlie? You'll have somewhere to go. Uh, we're also working on some farm to table cooking segments that are taking advantage of some of these great things that we grow here and showing off that in the kitchen. And we're also developing something called the local dirt. And that's actually a new name for the, the, the place that we can share the pictures of what you're growing in your own backyard. That is the local dirt. So here is your first installment of the local dirt. Here's the dirt on winter gardening in a northern climate. Michael Heim has several examples in his woodland garden near Hayward, Wisconsin, including a hardy cactus, cherry laurel, and maidenhair fern, American holly, and a hillside of rhododendron. Lila Ann White shares a taste of spring with anemones, delicate pink tulips, lupin and iris. Roses and clematis make for good neighbors in her Duluth garden, along with masses of monarda. And just take a minute to let her spring display of potted blooms sink in. That is a welcome sight. Mary Jo brings us right into the heart of summer with a mixed border of Monarda, Liatris, and Rudbeckia, all backed by a beautiful PG hydrangea. Annuals include a sparkler of Cleome, bright orange Tithuania, or Mexican sunflowers that make a nice backdrop for the red blooms of amaranth. Thanks for sharing the dirt on what you've grown. If you have pictures to share or garden projects or a special plant, please send them in to Great Gardening at WDSE.org. You may see them in a future show or on our Instagram feed. Your images inspire. Well, it is fun to have that blast of summer at the end there. And we'll be back to answer more questions and set you up for success with the top vegetable varieties and elements of a great garden plant right after this. Well, welcome back to the Great Gardening Spring Special. We've got your questions coming in, thank you. Remember, you can email too at ask at wdse.org to get in the queue. And now let's talk about vegetable gardening, Bob. There are lots of varieties out there. If I'm a beginner, it's overwhelming. <laughs> So where do I start? For someone that's grown them for a number of years, vegetables, uh, where do I start? Because there's so many new varieties all the time that we're looking at. But uh, certainly variety selection is, is really critical, particularly on warm season crops. You really want to pay attention to that. And we'll share a few with you. And St. Louis County Extension does have a recommended list that's available uh, just by contacting the office there. Uh, very extensive, about 10 page list of sources and other varieties. We cut it down to maybe five pages. <laughs> yes. Or at least five uh, <laughs> items. So yes. take a look at those. We, we start with tomatoes, right? You asked for a few, so I took the number one uh, vegetable crop grown throughout the United States, tomatoes. Kind of an irony, because at one time we thought they were poisonous, and now it's the number one crop out there. But um, I just gave you a couple that are surefire. Celebrity for a nice slicer. And then we had Sun Gold. There's a kissing cousin called Sun Sugar, which I prefer a little bit because it doesn't split quite as much. But that's a tangerine colored cherry tomato that is indeterminate. You need a little space to grow it. But eat both of those, you're consistently going to be able to get them outside in, in every given year. 
Uh, I want to mention broccoli. Broccoli is the number one out of the cabbage group. There's a lot of attention on the cabbage family because of some of the, the real uh, uh, cancer preventing properties that have been associated with this group and broccoli is the number one among them. And uh, Pac-Man I mentioned because a lot of people for smaller gardeners really like that crop. You can put it in a foot apart, uh, very productive. Seeds getting a little hard to find there. But the other option is Arcadia, where you're going to spread it out and you're going to get that terminal head, but then you're also going to feed it and water it properly and you're going to be harvesting all those lateral heads. So you get tremendous amount of production per square foot. Uh, we've also got, uh, everybody loves carrots and uh, you might want to try this variety called mokum, particularly with the kids. It's one of those snackables where they'll get it out of the garden. And I've seen this many, many times with farm families where the kids are just harvesting, rubbing a little dirt off and consuming them in the field. And mokum is a variety. They're tender, sweet, a real nice elongated carrot if you have a little lighter soil that, that does real well for us. Uh, the question we keep getting on peppers, which is real interesting. We had a little feedback there that uh, they are able to ripen them Peppers are really sun lovers, so the warmest spot that you can find for them, even in darkened containers, and that's going to be part of our trial. But uh, I mentioned Ace. Ace will come consistently. It won't always ripen for you. It's thin-walled, but it's always there every year. Taki's Ace is a, is a wonderful variety. And then King of the North will ripen for you. A nice bell that will give you a nice red color. Uh, beets are so well-established and so well-grown in this area and so very nutritious. Uh, they do can, contain their own antioxidant, uh, uh, a pigment called betalin that's uh, been known to be very, very nutritious, unique to beets, red beets that is. And one you might want to look at is Early Wonder Tall Top. That is an heirloom and it's very nice. productive. It gives you beautiful tops which you can use for greens and then the beets are very productive as well. And then among the golden beets, uh, Touch Tone Gold, there, there are several golden beets varieties out there but this one tends to germinate a little better. Generally, don't suggest that people uh, moisten seed before, and except maybe in the case of golden beets. So if you put them in a little moisture overnight, not any longer than mm -hmm. that, and then seed them in and make sure you have a consistent water supply that they don't dry down, that will help with your germination uh, percentage with some of those particular varieties. Particularly the golden beets are a little tricky to germinate. That's those, those are some pro tips. I love it. And I love to be set up for success. So we have a whole bunch of questions coming in, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you a little quick. Um, here is one. Uh, what type to, of soil to use for seed starting? We touched on that. Right, the lightest you can get with no fertility and no moisture control. Uh, lingonberry bushes have been planted for five years. They bloom profusely but have no fruit. They have six plants in Hermantown. What are they doing wrong? Uh, they're not doing anything wrong. We just struggle with the climate on those. And uh, we can grow lingonberry plants. We struggle with the fruit. That's something we really need to take a look at the research on. It's spring, late spring frosts that give us trouble there with the bud initiation for the flowering and the fruiting process. Hmm, but lingonberries, yum. Yeah, I started a new small raised bed garden last year. My beets produced a lot of greens, but not a lot of beet under the ground. I want to do a soil test this year, but I'm wondering what's the best place to go. Well, University of Minnesota. We're all advocates and yes. graduates of the University yes, of Minnesota. Yes, we are. Yes. Uh, just look up uh, on the web, uh, Soil Testing Lab, University of Minnesota. All the instructions are there. But we'll go back again to her question quickly. Beets that weren't forming. If she's in a raised bed with a soil mix that doesn't contain enough phosphorus potentially or potassium, probably not a good mix there. And that's the reason she's not getting a good uh, root formation there. So soil tests that I'd be willing to bend, it's either going to be pH issue or it's going to be a phosphorus or potassium issue there. Okay. Well, here is an update from Scott Nelson. He's telling us that his peppers in containers on a southeast facing deck take 20 days and a lot of patience and he gets them to turn colors. So That's there you good. Go. Again, <laughs> heat accumulation. <laughs> heat. Uh -huh. Peppers are unique because uh, both soil and root to temperature as well as the foliage temperature, both are critical. They are a warm season crop, and the warmest spot that you can find uh, is going to be the best spot. He's a smart man. All right, well, now we know more about seeds and varieties. You know what, Bob? You also had some gu guidelines for us for putting your garden in the perfect place. So let's take, about, take a look at those, that list of things, questions we should ask ourselves when we decide, I'm going to put a garden in. Yeah, beginners and those of us have been at it for a while. Uh, site selection is important. 
all your warm season crops, anything that sets fruit of all types, whether the fruit is a pepper or whether the fruit's a strawberry, full sun. So you gotta have sun, take down a tree or two, thin a little bit if you need to, uh, partial shade for the greens. And there's a lot of good potential there, everything from lettuce uh, to spinach uh, will take partial shade. Fruit, gotta have full sun. Soils are gonna be critical, whether they're in a raised bed or whether they're out in your backyard. Uh, garden, you want to make sure that you've got good drainage, raise the bed if you need to, either a raised bed or just pulling the soil up, and then uh, be sure that you've got good and adequate nutrition, and that does start with a soil test from the University of Minnesota or the University of Wisconsin. We're not partial, are we? <laughs> they do a great job. These are, in, and we're just joking, but these are actually certified labs, meaning the results are going to be very, very reliable and uh, the results will, will stand up in a courtroom challenge if need be. So get some good information, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin soil test labs. Okay. And then uh, nutrients, absolutely essential. So you want a soil test, you want to optimize, not too much, not too little. We don't want a bag, just grab a bag of 10, 10, 10, constantly be pouring in more nutrient than we need. Too much of a good thing can be b bad. Hey, we gotta get that pH, the acid range in an appropriate range. And we want to look at organic matter as well. So we're going to compost everything we possibly can and make sure we're incorporating some additional uh, organic matter. Variety selection, extremely important. And Especially, we'll be talking in yep, future yep. shows about that, particularly for us this far north, particularly with warm season crops. And what about spacing? Why is that important? Well, spacing is important because some some plants you think you're getting by by cramming them together when really you're diminishing the productivity. Let's take a look at an eggplant, which we can grow in this area under warmer conditions, and we're introducing more people as the climate's warming a little bit. You put them uh, eight to 10 inches apart, you might get one fruit, spread them out to 18 inches, vigorous plant, and you're gonna get three, four, five, six fruit per plant. So you really have to take a look at every transplant you've got. You wanna give them enough room, and even if you have fewer plants, you wanna optimize the room, and you're gonna get higher yields as a result, and less work to do in as well. I'm all for that. <laughs> and water wisely. That and we want to, we're going to talk a lot about watering because uh, once again, we want to avoid overhead watering. We want to do more and more down on the ground line with ooze tubes, perforated hose, trickle tapes. Uh, these are the things that get the water down where it's needed. We don't need it in the foliage. We want it in the ground. It also minimizes evaporation of water, which is what's one thing that's contributing to the difficulty we're having in the atmosphere with uh, climate change. It's not just CO2, but there's also a lot of water vapor that's been evaporating and okay. it's causing some of these weather issues. So keep the, okay. keep the uh, moisture to the plant when it needs it down on the ground. Okay, Bob, we're running out of time already. Darn it, <laughs> darn it. Um, so really, you have some pictures that were pretty awesome that were a, a small garden that you planted for maximum um, productivity, right? You had to progress, and I, I give all the credit to Burton Deb Lane and out in Cloquet. They asked about a garden design and a garden plan. So they got a small garden here that they put together and we'll show you the deer fence they put around it. I suggested and drew up a little design for them, which they followed quite well. Uh, block planting, less weeding, weed control with poly tubes and a little bit of netting. Uh, this system has worked for them for 10 years and uh, the yields have been tremendous out of that small area. And to end, once again, when you lay a plot like this out, remember, even during our summer months, the sun is in the south, so all your taller plants are gonna be in the northern parts of, the, of your garden so they don't shade anything. Mm -hmm. So you can trellis the peas, the corn, the squash, the cukes go up the trellises all on the north side so that your beets and beans and tomatoes and other things will grow well and not be shaded. Okay. I'm just so excited to be able to plant something. This is all good information. <laughs> and now we're taking a little trip to Hayward where Scott and Paulette Smith have an amazing garden surrounding their home. They're Chicago transplants and they pick their spot based on the proximity to the Berkey Ski Trail. Welcome to our property and our gardens. We call it affectionately Pine Meadow. I'm Scott Smith and this is my wife Paulette and we are in Hayward, Wisconsin. I've gardened most of my adult life, but these gardens were started about eight years ago after our home was built in Hayward. I would like to mention the uh, Japanese fern. When we tried to grow that in Chicago, it really didn't do too well. But here in the colder climate, it has just taken off. 
And of course the Haases do well. You know, in the spring it has a totally different look. Spring plants, uh, woodland anemones, and so it, 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 I kind of like that it changes from, you know, month to month. So this is our newest attempt at a little, I call it the English garden. I just wanted something colorful and against the garage wall. This interesting plant is Verbena bonariensis, the little tufts on the top. Sunflowers. See the monarch on the clematis? This is a walker weeping caraganga. It's a Siberian uh, tree. It does not get very tall. It gets a little yellow flowers on it in the spring. Well, we have a lot of uh, perennial grasses, sky racer, miscanthus, variegated moor grass. And the grasses really add a lot of texture and um, motion, I think. Delphiniums, a lot of echinacea. This year, when we haven't been going other places, we've had a lot of time to enjoy the garden. And uh, we do love it. We stand up on the deck and look at it and say, we're so blessed. <laughs> It is so fun to see green growing things and be able to enjoy this with you guys. Thank you so much for being part of this very first spring special. Well, it's we awesome. Had, we've enjoyed it for sure. And uh, we're just so fortunate to have this opportunity to share a little bit of what we've learned about the gardening uh, profession. And uh, we're so thankful for public television making this available to all of us really, Karen. Yeah. And we're so thankful that you were able to facilitate and host this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to be with you guys. Thank you. Well done, Karen. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be, out, I'll be out shopping. I'll be out <laughs> checking it out. Okay. So thank you both for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and your resources and your love of garden. And, you know, you can send your pictures to share your dirt from your neighborhood by email. Send those to greatgardening at wdsc.org. And um, make sure you check us out on Instagram, Great, Great Gardening WDSE. Now look for the new season of Great Gardening to launch Thursdays at 7.30. That's a new time, starting April 1st. For all of us here, spring is coming. There's questions we'll hold for next time. Enjoy the spring. We'll see you soon. The old uh, straw bales that have kind of deteriorated, I use in the, uh, for the potato growing medium and uh, we have three different kinds of uh, potatoes growing in here. And I make jalapeno jelly, and it's famous. My neighbors are always dropping hints. Do you have any more of that jalapeno jelly? It's really, really good. Some foxglove, monarda. And lots of bees. Lots of bees and lots of butterflies. I never knew there were that many kind of bees. There's like a hundred different kind of bees. A lot of hummingbirds. Usually they're empty by the end of the day, the four feeders are. They're actually pretty active right now too. <laughs>